Hello, welcome to the Humanities Forum. Thank you for coming. I'm Jim English. I'm the director of the Forum. Uh, this is the final event in the fall term of our year-long series on the topic of sex. The program's going to pick up again. Uh, you might have noticed we had some of the upcoming events on the screen a moment ago, but I'll, uh, I'll just mention uh, a couple of highlights. Uh, the program picks up in January with the launch of our film series on cinema censorship uh, and the scandal of sex. That first film is on Janu January 20th, uh, Syndrome and a Century, the Thai film, and that will be at, as will the whole series, at International House, which is 3701 Chestnut Street. Uh, on January 27th, the, uh, the Wednesday after the film series begins, we have our, our next lecture here in Rainey Auditorium in the museum. Uh, the Princeton historian of gender and sexuality, Regina Kunzel, is going to discuss the role of psychiatry and psychoanalysis uh, in the forming of sexual identities in 20th century America. Um, the, the week after that, we have our, our, our rescheduled talk by Terry Castle on the, uh, uh, this, this category that she describes as the not a woman um, so um, there's a whole semester still to come, and I urge you to take a look at our schedule and consider attending some of those exciting events. Um, let me thank Classical Studies, my colleague Jeremy McInerney, uh, who's the chair of that department, for co-sponsoring our lecture tonight by Professor Goldhill. And as always, my sincere thanks to my own colleague in the English department, Heather Love, the R. Jean Brownlee, a professor of English, one of the foremost scholars in the field of queer studies, and the topic director of the sex program. Heather's going to introduce Professor Goldhill. Uh, and thanks, everybody, and welcome to the um, Penn Humanities Forum series on sex. Uh, this is the end of our semester. We've heard wonderful talks so far this semester on everything from pederasty in the medieval church to changing family structures in 20th century Iran to the persistence of binary gender and contemporary research on epigenetics. Uh, and I think this lecture by Simon Goldhill was, seems like a fitting way to close out the semester because his own work moves so widely across historical periods, geographical regions, genres, and cultures. In work on Greek tragedy, narrative theory, ancient erotic fiction, and the afterlife of Greek literature and culture, Professor Goldhill has given us a truly remarkable range of perspectives and frameworks for thinking about human gender and sexuality. And sort of looking over his um, career, his really extensive publications, I thought he's less like a lecturer in our sex series and more like a sex series unto himself. <laughs> Simon Goldhill is professor of Greek literature and culture at Cambridge University and fellow and director of studies in classics at King's College, Cambridge. He's also the inaugural John Harvard Professor in the Arts, Social Science, and Humanities at Cambridge, and the director of the university's Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities. He's also a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Goldhill is the author of Language, Sexuality Narrative, The Oresteia, and Love, Sex, and Tragedy, How the Ancient World Shapes Our Lives. His book, Sophocles and the Language of Tragedy, received the Runciman Award, and Jerusalem, City of Longing, won the Independent Publishers Gold Medal for History. Goldhill works both deeply in Greek culture and also works on its reception very deeply. Um, for instance, his book, Foucault's Virginity, argues that accounts of ancient sexuality are distorted because they leave out insights gleaned from engagement with ancient erotic poetry and dialogues. Most recently, Goldhill has turned to consider the Victorian obsession with antiquity. His 2012 book, Victorian Culture and Classical Antiquity, Art, Opera, Fiction, and the Proclamation of Modernity, which won the Robert Lorry Patent Award, examines how sexuality and desire, the politics of culture, and the role of religion and society were considered and debated by the Victorians. So tonight we'll actually be hearing, I think, from his continuing uh, research in Victorian Britain and very excited to hear his lecture titled A Very Queer Family Indeed. Please join me in welcoming Simon Goldhill to Penn. Thanks very much, Heather and Jim. It's a, a real pleasure to be back in Penn as ever. We can begin with a kiss, although this will not turn out to be a love story. 
at least not a love story of anything like the usual kind. One afternoon in 1853 in Cambridge, England, an intense evangelical 23-year-old student sat on the sofa with a plumpish, earnest 12-year-old girl on his knee, as he had so often that year. And now he carefully proposed marriage. She burst into tears, but as he wrote later with an unself-aware pride, she said nothing girly or foolish. Instead, she tied the ends of his handkerchief together in a knot and gave it to him. He kissed her, and to the unabating anxiety of her widowed mother, the engagement was official. Six years later, as soon as she was 18, they married. He went on to be the Archbishop of Canterbury at the height of Victoria's reign, and she went on to discover that her passion was directed towards women. She spent months in Germany leaving her baby and five children in desperate longing for a Miss Hall. Arch after the Archbishop's early death, she spent the last 20 years of her life sleeping in the same bed with the daughter of the previous Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, this is not a trendy Bloomsbury group story where such affairs might be passed off in the name of love and art, but a tale from the heart of the British establishment. The Archbishop and his wife had six children, none of whom ever had heterosexual intercourse, as far as we can tell. Certainly none of them ever married. Two died young. The three boys all became famous writers. Fred became a society novelist and summered on Capri, as we say. Arthur became a best-selling essayist who became a Cambridge Don and spent his days in a series of passionate, unconsummated affairs with young men. Hugh, knowing best how to distance himself flamboyantly, became a Roman Catholic priest after a long friendship with the loopy Baron Corvo, an openly homosexual man. The daughter Maggie, who was the first female Egyptologist to publish, found a passionate relationship with Nettie Gourlay, with whom she lived for many years in the same house as her mother and her lover. The only example I know in Victorian Britain, or in fact in pretty well anywhere, of a gay mother and a gay daughter living together with their lovers. This then was the Benson family. Archbishop Edward White Benson, his girl bride, Minnie Sidgwick, and their renowned children. It could make for a sensational story. It's certainly a very queer family indeed. Now, this series is on sex, and I will have more than enough material to talk about, despite the children's apparent abstinence. But first, I need to outline four crucial factors in my story. First of all, this family is especially remarkable because it wrote constantly about itself in public, in private, and in the semi-private world of circulated diaries and letters that's typical of Victorian life. Edward White Benson, Minnie Benson, and Arthur Benson all wrote diaries. The children read their parents' diaries after their deaths. Arthur wrote the official biography of his father, the life and letters of his sister Maggie, a biography of Hugh, his brother, three autobiographies, a memoir of his mother left unfinished at his death, and his diary is 180 volumes long. <laughs> he also wrote essays and fictions which dramatised the life of a Cambridge don, an author, and thus produced a vivid public persona of a secluded writer. Fred wrote novels which appear to stage scenes of his parents and his own relationships more bitterly than his witty and sunny memoirs. And he too wrote three books of autobiographical reminiscences. Hugh also wrote an autobiography, but only one, but he did die young. Uh, they all worried in print and in private how memory distorted the past and how the, after death hagiography set in as a corruption of intimate and complex recollection. They all struggled with unforgivable hatred and regret which they performed and masked across the different genres of literary production. The family published over 200 books. This extraordinary public output of self-representation and family stories is fenced by the circulation of letters between them all, adding up to thousands of unpublished pages. This is a family that wrote itself. What this means is not just that we have remarkable information of a sort that's unparalleled for almost any period, 
From an intimate description of Minnie's wedding night to blow-by-blow accounts of the gay scene at Cambridge at the turn of the century to six different accounts by different members of the family of that first kiss. It also means that our image of sex and sexuality is formulated through what we could call a new technology of writing. It's really only in Victorian Britain that the massive circulation of letters was made possible by the postal service, by the rapid circulation of stories made possible by railroad and and newsprint, and the practice of diary writing and sharing became as popular as the genre of biography. There's a remarkably rich layering of discourse, therefore, about sexuality that needs a special care to tease out. Now, my second point of background is that Edward White Benson, of course, was a passionate Christian who headed the Anglican Communion at the height of the British Empire. Minnie Benson came from an equally serious background and had a midlife conversion experience that changed her relationship to her body and her friendships. It's impossible to talk about sexuality without this religious framework. But all the children, to their parents' despair, lost their faith. None of them would stand in the monument their father built. All too much discussion of 19th century sexuality takes place without taking account of the real and pressing importance of religion in the public and private lives of Victorian men and women. But you can't do sex without religion, in this family above all. Now, third, the era through which my story unfurls from 1853 to 1940 is the period in which the science of sexuality takes a particular intellectual and institutional shape, and in particular, as very many historians have discussed, with the development of psychology came the pathologizing of sex into sexuality. Now, homosexuality as a term and as a pathology has a very short history. What the Benson Archive allows us to see is what it's like to live through that sea change of self-understanding. Arthur's diary is full of descriptions of men desiring men, but it uses the word homosexual only twice in the last year of his life in 1925. And in both cases, it's hyphenated into two words, homo-sexual, and applied to other people's problems. None of the other members of the family use such terminology at all. Even when discussing Oscar Wilde, their own remembered desires, their mother, their relationship, their fears. The story of the Bensons is telling because it traverses this crucial juncture in modern Western self-representation of sex. And it provides a remarkable insight into the formation and construction of a language and a comprehension of things that is now all too often regarded as natural. And my fourth point of background is this. This is a multi-generational and polymorphous history. My point is not so much that most histories of sexuality like to focus either on male desire for males or the invention of the lesbian or marriage in Victorian culture, while mine does all three and with knobs on. Of course, I'm quite happy to tell you that. Uh, Rather, it's important that sexuality, for most people, takes shape within a family history. And what that this family gives a particularly vivid sense of the interplay between inheritance and anxiety. Edward White Benson suffered from terrible fits of depression. Arthur was hospitalized for depression for several years. Maggie was forcibly hospitalized for madness. One of her symptoms was a hatred of her mother. The father's Christian anxiety about the sinfulness of sexuality was intensely felt by all the children. And I'm fascinated by the way in which a sense of sexuality is a shared familial issue and how the stories of sexuality are made possible or impossible within a familial as well as a broader cultural context. Now, there are going to be lots of intimate and personal stories in what follows. But for me, it's crucial that we don't simply rehearse the modern bourgeois individual story, a deeply self-serving one always, that sexuality defines an identity and belongs like an identity card to a person, or that sexuality is one's own business. Sexuality is never just one's own business, nor is sex, even and especially as many Victorian schoolmasters obsessed when you're on your own. So let us return to the kiss. What are we to make of a 23-year-old kissing and proposing to a 12-year-old girl? Well, Fred Benson, their son, describes it as if it were a romantic novel. 
And was he, 23 years old, masterful and convincing and convinced, writing his first love poem to his cousin of 11, sure in his own soul that Minnie was to be his wife as soon as she was old enough, and carrying that conviction through both to her mother and to her. It is, he says, an exquisite, tender scene of young love. Even allowing for the oddity of a son describing his parents' first kiss, this requires some rose-tinted spectacles. It's especially pointed that he could write like this after he had read his mother's intimate papers. When her husband died, Minnie was devastated, and part of her process of mourning was to write a daily spiritual diary, which became a reminiscence of her early life. Her remarks are a, a lapidary and fragmented reminders to herself, and all the more moving for the dark silences between the expressivity. Ed coming, fear of him, love, always a strain, never the love that casteth out fear. The proposal and her tears prompt retrospective distance. Oops, wrong way yet. Ease disclosure, tears and emotion. Why? No real thought about it after. She sums it all up brutally. A terrible time. Dreary. Helpless. From the first, the most fatal thing was the strain on my conscience of the position towards Edward and Mama. He had been allowed to tell me and was not allowed to speak. But he did. And more. And. Embrace. And all weight on my conscience. And which did I love best? It was not love that growing for him. I find those single words, hand, embrace, terrifying recollections of the confusion and distress, her sense of his transgressiveness that blows the cover of a youthful romantic fantasy of courtship. It was after reading this that Fred wrote what I started with. But where was her mother in all of this, you might ask? How could she let a 23-year-old approach her daughter? Mary Sidrick, Minnie's mother, was a young widow, a dignified and attractive woman whose son, Henry, Minnie's brother, would go on to be the great philosopher Henry Sidrick, who gives his name to the Sidrick site, the Cambridge Humanities campus. Mary was very fond of young Edward. I wish I could just come and take tea with you and stir your fire and stroke your face and have a nice chat with you this windy, rainy evening, she wrote after one trip to see him at Cambridge. She was only 41 when the 23-year-old Edward asked if he could approach her 11-year-old daughter. We have over 300 pages of letters of what happened over the next eight months. At first, she insists that she's... Uh, uh, super fond of him. I earnestly hope that you will not the less feel that under all circumstances my affectionate interest in you will never cease. That letter was written, she says, at midnight, in bed, thinking of him. But she's also quite clear that Minnie is far too young, and she's equally sensible that a 23-year-old man lacks maturity. She's also concerned that any hot-blooded fellow of 23 could scarcely be expected to maintain constancy over the minimum of six years' wait. They exchange letter after letter about his feelings. And the more she talks about how his feelings will change, the more she bolsters him in them. But gradually he wears her down, because, as she says, it will be a pain to me to give up all idea of it. She cannot bear to lose his friendship, and is therefore prepared for him to approach her daughter. If it will be more for your happiness and peace of mind to be decided one way or the other, pray do what you think wisest and best. Mary writes how she feels terrified and miserable that Edward is grieved beyond satisfaction. The dynamic between them is emotionally manipulative, divisive, knowing and pained. And she finally gives her permission. Over these eight months, Mary is not merely bullied and conjoled and persuaded, she conspires, encourages, and toys with the idea that she initially called wrong, very wrong. It seems that eventually she cannot bear the idea of a complete break with the emotional entanglement to give up all idea of it. She allows the proposal to go ahead for his peace of mind, she writes, to avoid her pain. Minnie 
has slipped out of sight. So where was Minnie's mother in this story? She was in her room alone at night writing to Edward intimate, emotional, angry and submissive letters about whether he could speak to her daughter about love. She was talking to her daughter about the possibilities of love, conveying her responses to her undeclared lover in the name of regulation, but performing with whatever self-consciousness a more intricate complicity. It's in this context that the kiss takes place. What we have then in this dialogue by letter is an extraordinary exchange that in modern terms would be called grooming. The trusted and respected friend of the family, he's actually a cousin, wins over the mother to guarantee compliance with his treatment of the girl. And throughout the relationship, Mary tries to bond with Edward to discuss Minnie's education and with Minnie to make a promise to tell her all the secrets that Edward reveals. It is, to modern eyes, a shocking and deeply unpleasant exchange. But I think our shock needs nuance. Mary asks her sister, Henrietta, what she would think of such an engagement, and Henrietta is quite clear that it's something pure and unworldly. Evident, Edward's evident religious fervour guarantees his decency. His older mentor, the bursar of Trinity College, also agrees it's a good thing for him to become engaged like this. Ruskin loved the 11-year-old Rose Latouche. Sabine Baring Gould, who wrote Onward Christian Soldiers, found a girl 20 years his junior and sent her off to get her, get her educated for two years before marrying her. No one afterwards worried about the Benson's courtship as Edward rose in public dominant prominence. But, and this is a really important qualification, they also all need to talk about it obsessively. That is the insouciance that Fred, their son, showed about the normality of this proposal then, this delightful little Victorian love story, as he calls it, is possible only by repressing the evident anxiety, emotional strain, and troublesome moral feelings of the participants. Their need to talk about it at length, to worry over its import. So we see three vivid vectors of sex, sexuality, in this opening narrative. First, a kiss is never just a kiss. It's a story told and retold over the years by different members of the family with different framings, different patterns of memory and pain and joy. Second, it's told and retold so many times because the family and the others are struggling to make sense of it. How does it fit into normative patterns of sexual interaction? Edward, the future archbishop, is certain enough that it's good and he draws everyone else into the magnetism of his certainty. But for everyone else, including the children, it's a more awkward event to judge in moral and social terms. And third, the event is surrounded by a tissue of complicity and self-interest and unrecognized desires. This contributes both to the need to retell the tale and to its ambivalence. This opening kiss, then, is an icon of the complexities that emerge when sexuality, writing, and religion interacts so fervidly. The kiss, though, was only the beginning. After six years, which many described as more like a schoolroom than a courtship, they did indeed finally marry. The wedding night was not a success. Here is how she recalled it 40 years later, a description of marital sex that is as rare for this era as it is painful. Misery. Knowing that I felt nothing of what I knew people ought to feel. Knowing how disappointing this must be to Ed. How evidently disappointed he was. Trying to be rapturous. Not succeeding. Feeling so inexpressibly lonely. And young. But how hard for him. Full of all the religious and emotional thoughts and yearnings. They had never woken in me. I have learnt what love is through friendship. How I cried in Paris. Poor lonely child, having lived in the present only, living in the present still. The nights, I can't think how I live. I couldn't have thought so much about myself as I do now. We prayed, but I didn't come near to God. I mean, I didn't. She was made desperately sad by her own ignorance, her sexual, emotional and spiritual numbness. She knew that she was unfulfilling to him and how she was faking unsuccessfully the rapture she wanted to feel. Even as she recalls how young and lonely and sad she was, she still, with emphatic underlinings, recognises the intense strain on him. As she wrote on the same day, 
He restrained his passion. Oops, no, I haven't got this one. He restrained his passionate nature for seven years and then got me. This unloving, childish, weak, unstable child. God pity him. She sees herself at a distance through his disappointed eyes and her self-dismay and retrospective pity. Yet she reverts to her own overwhelming sense of misery and loneliness and inability to pray. Throughout, it's the gap between her current sense of God and her former self that haunts her. There's a profoundly complex sense of loss, of potential, of the past, of her husband and their life, of her own earlier fantasies. There is absolutely no sense here of the adorable, exquisite, tender romance. Her children read this passage before they wrote about their parents' marriage. This sense of loss, however, is filtered now through her later understanding. I have learnt what love is through friendship. What she means is her long and repeated attachment to women. Her first affair had been with a Mrs Edwards, whom her son Arthur blindly recalled as devout and serious, loving tradition and antiquity. Um, Edward, Minnie's husband, had then taken her on his knee and enjoyed a return to duty and marriage. And although my heart sank within me and became as a stone, for duties stared me in the face, return she did. When her sixth child, Hugh, was born, she was visibly depressed uh, and she went to Germany to recover. There she met Miss Hall and felt hopelessly in love. It was a complete fascination, she wrote. Gradually the bonds drew round. Fascinated, fascination possessed me. Then the other fault, thou knowest, I will not even write it. But, oh God, forgive how near we were to that. She seems to have teetered on the edge of a fully sexual relationship in a wholly engrossing, intimate passion. Despite her turn to a protecting religious fervour, she continued finding female love for the next 20 years. She wrote to Charlotte Bassett, Did you possess me, or I you, my heart's beloved, as we sat there together on Thursday and Friday, as we held each other close as we kissed? And she signed the same letter with, Chat, my true lover, my true love. See, I am your lover, your true love. At the same time, she needs religion all the more to keep control. When one's heart is fullest, when the physical side of love asserts itself most, then one must love in mind that things may be wholesome and well. Despite holding, embracing, kissing, love should be in mind so that the physical side doesn't overwhelm. Eventually, though, she met Lucy Tate, the daughter of the previous Archbishop of Canterbury, and they ended their lives together, sleeping in the same bed together after Edward's death for 20 years. During this period, many talks of carnal stains, carnal affections, and praises that all carnal affections may die in me, and that all things belonging to the Spirit may live and grow in me. In the 1920s, when Fred came to write his mother's biography, he calmly informed the world that Lucy and his mother had shared a bed all these years, without, it seems, any expectation that anyone would find it scandalous or salacious. The veils of his storytelling now seem evident enough. But for modernity, always keen to rip down the veils, Minnie has become something of an icon in the history of lesbian desire. But to make her a heroine of the discovery of self-expression within bourgeois social and religious restraint, plays down two crucial elements of this story. First of all, not only was she married, but also Edward's death traumatised her. Throughout her marriage, her expressions of love for him are painfully heartfelt, privately even more than publicly. She also recalled the episode of her affair with Miss Hall like this. The letter. Ah, my husband's pain. What he bore and how lovingly, how gently. Our talk. My awful misery. My letter to her. What is clear from these shards of pained memory is that Edward was made well aware of Minnie's feelings and acted to her, from a later perspective, with a generosity and even understanding that she found remarkable. It would seem that although it was an evident strain, Minnie managed to combine the unity, patience and strength of married love with her engrossed, overwhelming, erotic passion for women. Lucy Tate actually lived with the Bensons before Edward's death and was friends with both of them. The Archbishop knew of his wife's feelings 
and an accommodation was found between such apparently contrasting drives. Their marriage was quietly, in an ongoing way, thoroughly unconventional, for all its paraded normality. It was an accommodation that eventually found a way of working for both of them over many years. Second, around Minnie, there were some terrible events too, in which her relationship with Lucy were implicated. Maggie, their daughter, went mad, and one causal symptom, the forces are overlapped, was her feelings about her mother's relationship with Lucy Tate. She resented that Lucy and her mother were together day and night. Her other daughter, Nellie, started to form an attachment with the composer Ethel Smythe, and Minnie found this impossible, and she argued ferociously with Ethel. The idealised project projection of a world of female intimacy that modern scholars have created is far more difficult in reality. The scene of mother, daughters and friends in the same home becomes a disturbing picture of dysfunctionality, where the vast Victorian bed echoes with the violence, despair and breakdowns that finally left Minnie and Lucy alone at the centre of the house. So the story of Minnie's sexuality then demonstrates vividly just how difficult it is to define normativity within even the apparently over-regulated arena of Victorian sexual behaviour. The Archbishop knows of his wife's feelings and their marriage progresses. She struggles with the carnal stain of her erotic desire and she finds hugs and kissing well within the bounds of acceptability. Sleeping in the same bed with another woman is comfortable for her and for her son publicly to acknowledge. As Virginia Woolf wrote to the same Ethel Smythe in 1930, where people mistake is in perpetually narrowing and naming these immensely composite and wide-flung passions, driving stakes through them, herding them between screens. And she concludes pertinently, what's the line between friendship and perversion? We might be still thinking about Bloomsbury of the post-war era in particular as a self-consciously radical place which set out to tear down the veils and restrictions of their parents' Victorian sexuality. What Minnie Benson shows is that already to try to name her queerness is to drive a stake through its heart, to herd it behind the screens of our own desire for naive identity politics. And that such fluidity is part of sexuality long before the Bloomsbury group claimed it for themselves with characteristic self-aggrandizement, and may indeed be part of the dynamics of playfulness and regulation that's endemic to sex itself. Now, Arthur Benson, the Benson's oldest surviving son, after university taught classics at Eton, and then retired to Cambridge, first as a writer, then as a fellow, and eventually master of Magdalen College. The prompt to leave Eton was the opportunity to edit Queen Victoria's letters, he was a close friend of Henry James, of Thomas Hardy, Edmund Goth. He was at the centre of British literary life. His books of essays, which he himself despised, are reflective Edwardian ruminations about life, and they sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Their style was brilliantly parodied by Punch, which imagined his next volume would be called At a Safe Distance. Even his friends mocked the difference between his waspish conversation and his persona as a genial philosopher gazing from a college window. Benson lived his whole life in all male institutions, except when he returned to his mother's otherwise all-female house. He never married, but received many marriage proposals on the basis of his prose by women he'd never met. And one woman, an Amer American, a uh, married heiress, again in response to his literary self, made him an unsolicited gift of millions of dollars, with which he built up Magdalen College's current land ownings. Uh, he began his diary only when his father died, but wrote obsessively every day, except when he was fully hospitalised for madness, writing up to 50 pages a day, um, dozens of letters, while producing three books a year. Academics, listen. He was a real graphomaniac. Nearly the last entry in his diary is the record of his own heart attack as it's happening. I have just woken up with a terrible pain in my left arm, he writes. I hope I die with dignity like Dr. Arnold. <laughs> Rather than call for help, as usual, he records what he's feeling. Now, Arthur Benson offers a unique insight into the world of male desire at Fantasy Act at Cambridge. The gap between sex and sexuality is vivid here, however. 
In 1913, age 51, he confesses he has never kissed anyone. He is profoundly reticent in life and in what he writes. This typical Arthur Benson narrative describes a beautiful evening stroll at Eton. Ah, oh, I've lost this one too. There was a window lighted up, full of flowers. The room inside still, but just as I came past, there was a boy in a nightgown to the window with a candle, put it down and began to move the flowers, smiling. He's enchanted by the picture and by the fact that the boy was so unconscious that anyone saw him. But then he concludes, and then came a further surprise, of which I will not speak, but which I shall not easily forget. Inta Lilia. Arthur takes us with him to the window as voyeurs and then cuts off the story teasingly. This is in his own diary. He refuses to say what he saw or felt or did, but insists it's unforgettable. We are left to ponder, even whether he's withholding a sex will or some other sort of secret, though the last two words of Latin, into Lilia, are of course are a quote from the Song of Songs, which must be a hint he's having erotic thoughts at least, encoded as they are in the double decency of the Latin translation of a biblical text. In 1882, his second year in Cambridge as a student, something terrible and traumatic happened to him in H1 King's College, the building where my office is. He records it as my darkest hours. But we still have no idea what happened, even though it was grim enough for him to record its anniversary repeatedly in his diary for 30 years. This pattern of reticence, even and especially in his own diary, is itself fully part of the politics of vice that requires a particular daring even to name. Yet he talks non-stop not only about the various boys with whom he has special relationships, but also a great deal about others. And his chatter gives a fascinating insight into the construction of sexuality in this key period of incipient pathology. So take the word sexuality itself. In his diary, he constantly struggles with the vocabulary of physicality and feeling. Sexuality is a newfangled term that always smacks of the new sciences of psychology and sexology, which it should be remembered were being pioneered at Cambridge at this time. A surprising number of dons were patients of Freud's, for example, and went to Vienna you know, weekly or monthly. And the whole socialist, sexual, liberationist, vegetarian crowd made a hub at King's College around the lead figure of Edward Carpenter. But Arthur never once in 180 volumes, uses the word sexuality of himself, only of others, and usually with the further distance, distancing of inverted commas. He has sexuality. Here's a typical moment from 1904. The novelist, Mrs. Craigie, uh, not so famous now, has sent him her most recent book, The Vineyard. He writes, I don't know what to say. It's a sexual book, like Hardy is. You know, Tess. I'm not at home in this region at all. Do all properly constituted men feel like that? A wild and rather brutish pursuit of a mate? And are women so morbidly passionate too? I've never felt this, never come across it. He recognises the problem immediately. The book, like Tess of the Durbervilles, is sexual. It marks a new way of thinking. It's something of the era. But Arthur is not at home at all in this region. Uh, there is no place, there's no sense of fitting in when it comes to sexuality, not just as a subject for literature, but also as the way of writing a life. It's just not where he's at home. This is because he can't empathise with the erotic feelings that Mrs Craigie represented. Is desire something for properly constituted men? His language is in fuzz, if inherently if fuzzily medicalised and moralised. Perhaps he suggests to himself it's only men who are sick or improper who have such feelings. This sort of feeling seems to reduce humans to animals, wild and rather brutish, where desire is comprehended as no more than the pursuit of a mate. He can't find the right words. He can't find himself on this new map of sex. He could spot where things weren't quite right. He was discomforted by his friend Charles Sale, who was too open about everything. There had been a scandal when Sale was seen holding a boy's hand at a concert. And when Sale died, Benson writes, 
I expect S. Sale was a homosexual person, um, perhaps of perverted fancies, but blameless morals. He went about accosting beautiful girls and boys, fated them, caressed them, flattered them, but did no one an ounce of harm. Now, the combination of perverted fancy and blameless morals would confuse our contemporary press greatly, as would the idea that one could accost and caress young people and do them no harm. Fifteen years earlier, when Sale was still alive, he was more explicit. He goes about pied or puone, and why I dislike his sentiment is because it's all based on looks. It's all very harmful, harmless, but it is a kind of sensuality. He puts the key term in Greek. Pied or puone means looking or staring at boys. Hence the remark that he doesn't like sentiment, an emotional, expressive, erotic engagement, when it's all based on looks, both a boy's good looks and a man staring. Benson, as ever, wants more, though, of course, for him, the opposite of looking is talking, not touching. He's striving to place sail on the map. But the struggle to fit the example of sail into the Greek talk of male desire ends up capturing only Benson's confused distaste. He was even more worried by Olive Richmond, future professor of Latin in Edinburgh, who used to hang around the boys of King's Choir. Benson is quite clear this is wrong. O.R. has a morbid predilection for boys. It's a sort of sexuality, an erotic mania, though wholly pure and good. <laughs> the the war, word morbid is the classic 19th century term for the uneasy space between physical and moral disease, which is made more up to date by the modern term sexuality and erotic mania. But he ends wholly pure and good. This seems to mean that because he committed no sexual act, no physical expression of his desire, he's maintained his purity and goodness. Benson is emphatic repeatedly that Richmond was in difficult terrain. I told O.R. he must drop these boys or that he would ever be misrepresented. I told him today that it was a sexual perversion. It's a vivid indication of the shifting language of erotics that a man's desire for boys can be recognised as a perversion, as a mania, as a morbid sexuality, and yet be classified as pure and good because there's no physical behaviour, no specific act that follows from it. It seems to be a judgment poised precisely and awkwardly between a modern pathology of sexuality and an older definition of sexual transgression based on action. Here we can see how complex it is to live through this historical juncture, caught between a legal and religious system that still indeed increasingly criminalized only the acts of sexuality and a new pathologizing of sexuality which will make desire or expressions of desire themselves criminal. When he turns to write about himself, we see a similar clash of vectors. The case of Oscar Wilde, a woman's soul in a man's body, prompts him to wonder why I have always preferred men to women. Some theosophists would say it was because I had the soul of a woman in the body of a man. Whatever he suggests comfortably of Wilde, a woman's soul in a man's body, as soon as the same thought is applied to himself, to his self, he has to distance it immediately as the belief of some theosophist, a marginal and dubious group of modern theorists. Yet he's also absorbed 19th century psychology theory enough to write at the time, the reproductive instinct and its pleasures lie a great deal deeper than the super-induced civic virtues. To describe what is inside a man, his deeper sense of self, shifts between these different discursive registers, different ways to capture the sense of not fitting in to conventional civic virtues. Arthur Benson cannot rehearse the simple and trivialising modern language of sexual essence and preference, of sexuality as a pathology. He can't even write the word homosexual without a division in it. As it's changing, the language of sexuality is fissured, and Benson's language is pulled in different directions by these conflicting historical, scientific, medical, social, ethical, and religious forces. The Benson family offers a remarkable insight into this formative period of modern sexuality then. 
Not just because they trace and comment on the exemplary transitions from the earnest 1850s through the gay 1890s into the roaring 1920s, though they do remain fascinating guides to this history of change. Nor are they important just because they offer such a surprising gallery of possibilities within a society that also prided itself on the regulation of social and sexual propriety, though the picture of accommodation and exploration of relationships in and through the most privileged of social institutions is a telling counterweight to the current fascination with the more obviously and self-consciously outlandish groups of Bloomsbury or the aesthetes around Oscar Wilde. You don't need to go there for oddity. Indeed, one of the most remarkable features of the story I've been tracing is that it brings together men struggling with their desire for men, women experiencing desire for women, a marriage of conflicting desires, the interaction of widely different ages in erotic bonds, different generations responding to each other, and all talking and writing to each other about it at the same time. It's a true family romance, as Freud would have it, which offers a very different and more intricate matrix from the usual more restricted focus that historians offer. Rather, for me, what's most telling about the Bensons is the way in which convention and queerness are in constant and dynamic interaction, which allows us to see a sexual discourse under constant and often laborious construction. It's the struggle that they share and repeatedly mull over and write about between religious values and sexual needs, between social roles and playful difference, between public life and intimate intensity, between desire, physical acts, and a man's constitution, between living at the very center of the establishment and feeling a decentering untimeliness and alienation from the present. What makes this family truly very queer indeed is not just their unconventional sexuality, but more precisely how that sexuality is accommodated, denied and negotiated within the tram lines and travails of a very conventional family indeed. The Bensons are an exemplary case of why the language of homosexuality took so long to condense and solidify in British sexual discourse, and why it's so unsatisfactory a language of description for the generations in which it was being developed. The oddity of the Bensons, the way in which they do not conform to conventional models of sexuality, provides a refractive historical mirror for our own contemporary drive towards labelling the pathologies of desire. True queerness is what is hard to name. And if you want to write the history of sexuality in this period, it's the struggle over language, behaviour and self-understanding in which we find the real work of sex taking place. Thank you. I'm curious. I mean, this is this is not a family that I know about, and I have you know the typical stereotypes of the period. What are the ways in which the exchange of letters is treated or fetishized? Are these people giving letters to boys and getting letters back? Is there that thing you know the whole Michelangelo and Tadeo thing of yes. touching the same piece of paper? Um, I'm curious about where. Mm -hmm letters as exchanged objects figure for these children? They are deeply fetishized. Um, the most obvious example uh, that springs to mind was the case of Vaughan, the headmaster of Harrow School, which was going through rather a rough period. And one of the boys who'd gone up to Oxford uh, received a letter of passionate love from the headmaster of the school. And he showed it to his friend Simmons, who didn't know what to do, so he showed it to a don who said, sent it to the father of Simmons, who then went to Vaughan and said, if you ever try to take a job, you must resign immediately from the headmastership, and if you ever try to take a job anywhere in a position of authority over children and boys, I will announce what you've done. Which is why when Vaughan accepted the bishopric of, in, up in the north, I forget which one it was, he 
surprisingly to the rest of the world, except to the bishopric, and then withdrew his candidacy two days later when the father took the letter back and showed him <laughs> and said this is what's going to come out. That's a classic case where sexuality and desire has passed through this confusion. The letter becomes almost Othello-like in its transmission between people, you know, that sense of where is the suspicion, where is the doubt. Arthur Benson wrote over 3,000 letters a year. He sat every morning and wrote. He received them, he comments on them, he writes on them. It becomes an absolutely normal part of the day, as fetishized as your own email behavior, no doubt is. And um, the, he, one of the things that I found fascinating about that is that he, if you read in the archive, as I have many of these letters, you will find lines by passages saying, this is not for reading aloud. So the expectation was that the letter would arrive and you would read it to the family, except for some parts. So it also became a game of what do you say and not say. Minnie Benson found that her mother was inter intercepting her letters. And one of the saddest exchanges is when she's, um, when they're going through that six year courtship, Edward, the future archbishop, writes to Mary, Minnie's mother, and says, could you please really try and improve her letter writing style because she doesn't really write with the same sort of emotional feeling that I'd like to see in a girl's in my field says letters. And you think there, wow, <laughs> what sort of scene is that where the man writes the mother and says, could you train her to write with more emotion to show that she loves me properly? So yes, is the answer. There is a deeply fetishized network of letters. It's a crucial part of every working day. They boast of the number of letters they get and send each year in the same way that people talk about, oh, I came back from a day off and I had 400 emails. You know, it's exactly the same conversation. And the exchange is a series of patterns made possible by six mails a day. So you could, you could have three exchanges of letters on the same day in London. <laughs> but you can't do that anymore, except by email. Thank you. Um, I was just, uh, I love the way you introduced um, the family by saying, you know, none of them had sexual intercourse. Um, and so I was hoping to ask you a Mother little... Mother and father did, I should explain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that really is queer, if that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess um, it seems like one of the things that people have been interested under the rubric of queerness more recently would be the absence of sexuality, the absence of desire, right. the whole asexual movement yeah. um, as a mm. kind of new development. Still, I think it's sort of easier to read or more recognizable mm. to read perversion or desire, um, yep. same sex, you know, primarily. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, somebody like Wolf also can be thought of in relation to same sex desire, but also the absence of, yep. of desire, so on. So mm. I just wondered if, you know, thinking about the kind of Mm. not doing things, not feeling things as a kind of aspect mm. of the queerness and how to, how to think about that in this framework. Yeah, that's, a, that's very helpful. What I, I, I couldn't do in the space of a lecture, but I'll happily try and outline it a little bit more, is the extraordinary variety of response amongst these men in particular. With the women, with, with Minnie Benson, we get almost an excess of feeling. She describes so many feelings that she has, some of which are carnal, some of which are not, both for men and for women, and for men who are not her husband. I mean, she talks in her diary of one particular curate coming around and how she talked and how she, basically how she liked him very much. Um, so we get, with, with her, we get a lot of feeling. With the women, we tend to get an, an expression of feeling. With Arthur Benson, he writes intense anatomies of every single possible emotional reaction to a scene. So a boy comes to him and says, I've fallen in love with your lectures, I loved you, could you kind of And he said, I was so, and he goes through, he has like a 10 page analysis of, has he been manipulative, was he being manipulative, how could he, a boy, say that, I could never say that. It's a, you know, the whole game of reticence and non-reticence. So there's no doubt that there's an absolutely intricate filigree relation of feelings, and he describes his, tries to place himself on a map of feeling where reticence is all. And he says, so-and-so is terrible because he's not reticent. He's explicit, it's awful, explicit. You know, how could you be explicit? Yet, how does that turn into physicality? It just doesn't for him, but he is absolutely excruciated by that lack of physicality and talks about it all the time. So it's not a sort of a positive moment. All the children write that this is a religious inheritance. This is not a positive modern choice of asexuality. They are saying, we believe that sexual contact in a Christian world is corrupt and dangerous and a sign of the fall. 
and they've inherited that even as they lose their faiths, even as they're hanging around all the time with people who are talking about, I like little boys, I want to have sex with little boys. Even then, they're still saying this. So for me, it's the religion that changes it from the modern expression and is absolutely, absolutely crucial in that way. Um, and um, I suppose the oddest, I mean, the, I mean, Fred, we, I mean, with Arthur, we have so much information. With Fred and Hugh, we know that Fred holidayed in Capri. He writes in novels occasionally about how free and easy things were in Capri. But we have absolutely no piece of information on, in any of their work that they ever had sex with anybody. And we know so much about them. Now, we also know they burnt a lot of papers. So when I say they never had sexual intercourse, they never had sexual intercourse with women, as far as we're aware. They never indicated any wish to do so. Uh, if they did, they have burnt the evidence <laughs> consciously. So um, that's why there are no children further, why it's a sort of bounded project. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's, a com it's a complex issue. But for me, it's tied up with a very particular aesthetic of reticence that is so different from the earnestness of the 1850s. So in the 1850s, people are going around saying, I will tell you what I believe. I mean, evangelical, this is what I believe. You know, think of Henry James as your model. And you, know, you can never say what you believe. You can only write a very long sentence with 15 subordinate clauses, which might intimate something of a belief. You know? And Benson and, I mean, Benson's bought a Henry James house. They lived in Henry James. They were completely intimate together with Henry James. And so it's that sort of style of, you know, if you could find out, you couldn't find out because, I mean, they made fun of Henry James for saying there was a black apparition of a menacing nature at the door. When what they meant was, when what he meant was, there's a dog outside. <laughs> so. mm. Thank you so much for, for that uh, wonderful talk. I'm I'm wondering to what extent sexuality is at the forefront of everyone's mind, or how you would rank it among all the topics of daily life that uh, all this writing, no doubt, mm -hmm. must engage. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm wondering if you could walk us through a typical diary entry or a typical letter, yes. and and whether it's mm -hmm. topic number one or whether they are all the political and daily activities, the arrangements for tea and lunch and so on that come first, yeah. and if if there are if there is typical other content that that gathers around the issue of sensuality so that it's the kind of bridge into the topic or so uh, and and those areas might might also be quite revealing yes uh, that's a very helpful question um, the one or the one biography of Arthur Benson that has been written is incredibly emphatic on the sexuality and completely over emphatic on it and of course in a series on sexuality one's bound to talk about it more than one would necessarily do elsewhere I think to concentrate purely on Arthur for the moment because it's the most extensive evidence and the most interesting evidence. There's an absolutely fascinating shift. There is no doubt that a huge amount of what goes on in the diary is everyday gossip of the most tedious nature. While he is teaching at Eton, it is the schoolmaster's common room. You know, he said this, I said that, blah, blah, blah. There was this lesson, that lesson. That boy only got 52 out of 60. Should have done much better. Done, and all that sort of stuff. And it goes on for pages and pages, including huge numbers of you know, menus of dinners and things like that. And when he meets Queen Victoria, his writing is incredibly neat. And when he gets drunk, his writing is all over the place, and that, as you'd expect. But starting from there, what's fascinating is that this is men in an all-male environment talking repeatedly about the regulation of boys' lives. And it's through that talk at school of the regulation of boys' lives that sexuality comes up within, as it were, what you might call an inevitable or natural context, because they're worried about bad behavior in the house. There's a lot of boys locked up together, and it's a familiar Victorian worry. When he goes to Cambridge, he has a similar pattern of worrying about jobs and who's going to get the chair of this and who went for dinner where and all the stuff you would recognize in academic discussion. He writes a good deal about his literary work as he's doing it. And he writes a good deal about family memories. He writes all the time about his dreams and his internal psychological life because he is going mad at one point. And so he's obsessively writing about that. But again, as he writes about going mad, as he writes about losing control, one of the areas that naturally comes up is feelings towards his parents which I don't exclude from sexuality, and his feelings towards other men and boys in his relationship. In the same way, the everyday life of Cambridge revolved a good deal, as you suggested, around tea parties or lunch parties. But who does he invite to tea or lunch? Young men. Who he wants to bring on, who he wants to have intellectual conversation with. And there are pages of pages of 
discussion about, I met Mallory, as it were. That's the guy who first climbed Everest, who was one of his lovers. And he talks about what a beautiful boy Mallory was and how interesting it was to talk to him and what they talked about. Now, is that sexual or not? Yes, it is, because it's a man and a boy. He's quite clear he fancies him. But it's like reading the internal dialogue of a rather tedious relationship. You know, if you wrote down everything you thought about your lover while you were having a conversation, <laughs> it would be really very boring in general. So is that sexuality or not? You know, and that's what I'm very interested in doing, is taking sexuality away from the sex act, as, as Heather suggested. It's not really about the sex act. It's about in what way do you frame it by tea parties, by education, by talking. So you're right to say, don't extract it. And indeed, in a longer version of this, I would not try to extract it. I want to put it back in there. But in the same way, it's not as you might expect for Victorian culture, separated off into this unique place. It's not like there's a brothel out there or there's a marriage bed. Right? The idea that you have a relationship, the boys and men have relationships, is everywhere in town, constantly being talked about. So it's that rather strange mix of it being everywhere and nowhere, which I find a very attractive and interesting thought about how culture works and how hard it is, therefore, to pin down, despite the excessive verbiage with which we can approach it. Mm. Shred. Thank you so much. You started this by talking about the absolute fundamental interdependence of religion into mm. this story, and then it becomes this ghostly presence. Yeah. Everything you said and religion completely disappears. You're quite right. It doesn't in the, in the book, but I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. Let me bring it back in. I would love to bring it back in because it's absolutely central to the story in many ways. So uh, Minnie Benson had a conversion uh, experience through a relationship with another woman who was an evangelical Christian. Despite the fact she'd been living with the archbishop and her mother was also a very serious Christian, she never thought of herself as Christian until her, her late 30s. And she becomes a non-institutional, evangelical, passionate Christian. Now, the first thing to say is, wow, what's it like to be married to the Archbishop of Canterbury and not be an institutional Christian? How does that work? You know, that's a sort of very interesting act of rebellion through which you talk about yourself with your husband. Okay, and that was very, very important. For her, uh, you'll appreciate this, it meant when their eldest son died of meningitis at school, age 17, they had both invested a huge amount in the eldest boy, whom they thought of as a paragon of virtue. He was brilliant, he was charming, he was Christian, he was good, he was honest, he was true, all that sort of stuff. And they were really obsessive about his success. And when he died, the archbishop was completely crushed by this, to the extent that he says, that towards the end of his life, the main reason for dying, he says of himself, is that I will see into the secret of my son's death, of why it must have made sense to God. Absolutely crushed by it. And some of the most moving things the Archbishop wrote are the personal diary that we have for that period in Trinity College, Cambridge, where he wrote down what he was feeling. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Minnie rejoiced. She said, he's gone to heaven. What's the problem? So she celebrated her son's death as a religious transformation. And he, at that point, could not understand her. And that's an absolutely crucial part of their relationship, that at a certain point, the girl who'd been 11 while he'd been 23, all this sort of understanding, he's the one in charge, he's telling you what to think, he's telling you how to feel. At a certain crucial point, he knows he can't match her religion. And that is a sort of turning point in their lives. Now, how does that then play out? It plays out through her constant struggle between physicality and religion that she expresses in her life. We, I'd love to know what happened between them after this, but we don't know that. That's lost in some way. But um, it also means she, who was so intimate with her children in a way that he never was. He was a manic depressive. Bipolar, whatever one calls it in the correct terms. I mean, if one could diagnose 19th century diseases, he had the black dog. And he was distant and he was aggressive. He was charismatic. He was terrifying. Everybody says the same things about him. Extremely successful public Victorian figure, but to the family, terrifying. Footnote, Arthur Benson's first book, 
was a biographical fiction of a man called Arthur. Not him, of course, right? in which this Arthur writes on a piece of paper, I hate Papa, and buries it under a tree so that no one can see it. He publishes. <laughs> you see, so even the best sons had very ambivalent relations to the father. But the mother, they all say the same thing. She was wonderful. She educated us. She was fun when he was aggressive. She was lovely when he was horrid. They all loved their mother. But she, as much as he, told them about the horrors of carnality. And then, having heard this for all their lives, they then had to read her diaries. They didn't have to, but they did. And we have letters between the brothers say, I've just read Mum's diary. Have you read Mum's diary? Yeah, wow, what are we going to think about that then? <laughs> right? And you can imagine, I mean, it's extraordinary. And then they write the sort of stuff that I put up the screen first. So one of the things they're struggling with is how do we maintain our own childish image of our own mother when having read her passion and her torment and you can see an immense amount of work goes into buttoning down everything. And that's one of the ways religion comes out. Now, the other ways are extraordinary. Fred responded quite differently. Fred just pretended religion didn't exist. <laughs> the son of the Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Harrison. And Arthur writes these great entries in his diary. He said, I just met Fred. I'm totally outraged. Apparently, he'd never heard that anyone had cast doubt on the virgin birth. How could he be this? How could he be his father's son and not know about this? And it's ridiculous. And Fred just went, I don't care. Fred's, Fred's first book was called Dodo. It's a fantastically funny satirical novel, which you may have come across. Uh, and we know that his father read some of it and then threw it across the room and refused to finish it. And the point that I think, and this is complete speculation, he threw it across the room, was the moment at which Dodo says, I was alone, I was in bed last night, I had nothing to read, and the only book in the room was the Bible. Now, we've all been in that hotel room. You know? I said, she said, do you know, it's true what they say, it is a good book. <laughs> and at that point, I think the Archbishop would have just gone, ah, you know, and thrown it across the room. So Fred was completely, he just absolutely insouciant. Fred became a professional ice skater at one point. Now, for the son of the Archbishop of Canterbury, that is making a point, all right? <laughs> okay. And then Hugh became a, became a Roman Catholic. <laughs> you know? And became a famous preacher. The son of the Archbishop of Canterbury preaching in the Catholic Church. I mean, shocking as can be. So they all had their own ways of expressing their religiosity in a family setting. And for me, what's Christian is it's this family setting. Yet they all picked up the horror of sex from both parents in different ways. And that's a sort of, you know, that's how the Victorian heritage worked out through into the 1940s when Fred died. So. I just um, am curious to have you um, give a little more clarity on the extent to which you're treating these people as, in some sense, a lens on their era um, mm -hmm. that just happened to give us, you know, this enormous amount of documentation mm -hmm. from which we can then kind of generalize about their mm -hmm. contemporaries or whether this actual wealth of documentation actually makes them so specific and yeah. so nuanced um, yep. that they kind of lose their representative um, yep. capacity and maybe it's only that the frameworks that they're struggling with are typical of the era or something like that. It, yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a profoundly different, difficult question that goes right to the heart of what family history might look like and what exemplarity means in, in any period. So. Why I find this a particularly good place to think about that is, on the one hand, you couldn't get a more located, situated family. So you've got the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was formerly the headmaster of Wellington School, who was a Cambridge don, you, married to the woman whose family produces you know, the great philosopher who names the Sidric site, and uh, the children themselves, you know, incredibly famous in Britain throughout, up until the 1940s. I mean, huge best-selling authors, parodied in papers, well-known. You know, the editor of Victoria's Letters for Britain. You know, these are people who have, you couldn't get more centrally located, you know, both in terms of literature, in terms of institution. In terms of, so in that sense, they are exemplary of a particular form of dominant culture. 
okay? they, they must be in that sense. They stand for something. They self-consciously stand for something. They write all the time about how, what do we stand for? They describe themselves, interestingly, as resolutely middle class, which is, <laughs> which is perhaps not how we would do it. Um, and in that sense, you know, this isn't history from below. This isn't working class culture. This isn't you know, all that sort of stuff. I know that fully well. This is upper class exemplary institutional history. Yet, because of what they are, because of how queer they are, they just show you that you can't play that game. You can't do conventionality if you know that the Archbishop of Canterbury knows his, his wife likes women and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You, know, you just can't say that anymore. It doesn't make sense. So you have to find a way in which they themselves are self-consciously negotiating their exemplarity in a public and a private eye. And I find that absolutely fascinating that this is part of the problem. What is it to be exemplary? Which is why I quoted the Virginia Woolf saying, look, we keep naming these things. We shouldn't name them. It's too complicated. And in a sense, that's what I'm trying to, to, to do with this. Now, having said that, one of the things I'm trying to do, and I think is really important, is to remember that sexual history takes shape in a family particularly in this period. I mean, we may think we've escaped the family in some bits of the modern West. But in general, even so, most people have parents at some level. Actually, there's six million people who only have some parents, I mean, because of uh, artificial uses. But nonetheless, most people grow up in a family. And how those cross-references work, how you talk about your brothers, your sisters, and your mothers, and your fathers. And it's surprising how few sexual histories do that. I mean, some do. Of course, the better ones do. But think how many times you read a history of sexuality where it's about an individual here and an individual there and an individual there, and you never know who their mother is and what their father told them. And partly because you can't do it, but partly because people don't ask the question. And for me, that's, you know, seeing this as a moment of transition is absolutely crucial because you see the fault lines. You see the way things are growing. And so it's that combination of seeing the fault lines within a family that is both exemplary and so weird that makes it, for me, your question comes to life. And it shows that, yes, they are both absolutely exemplary and both completely unexemplary. And I'm quite happy with that. I like that tension. Um, you know, it's, at least it's fun. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Given um, their exceptionalism as obsessive writers and obsessive mm. self-reporters, and mm. I take it, I, I think I understood from your talk that they conceive themselves as exceptional um, in terms of their... Yeah their um, mm. literary productivity. How do they, or to what extent, do they also map themselves onto um, literary models? I mean, to what extent are there, are there diaries in any way, or, or are there um, uh, choices of expression, or the kinds of paradigms, or yeah. themes, or anything like that? Um, to what extent is there a kind of literary you know, dimension or background yeah. that... Yeah with which they're in some kind of conversation. Absolutely, I mean, 100%. So, uh, as I said, they were great friends with Henry James. They talk about literature with Henry James all the time. They're friends with Hardy, they're friends with Goss. They're absolutely located in the center of stuff. And so they know what they write. They write a whole series of things. And for me, what's most interesting, which is going back to Bridget's question, is that they obsessively write biography, not only of their own family, but of other people. And they write theoretically about the act of writing biography as they're doing it. And to the extent that, um, as, as some people may know, the, in 1906, the word autobiographiction was invented for Arthur Benson by, by a journalist writing about him. And you would think the word like autobiographiction must be a 1990s post-structuralist term, right? But it's not. It's a 1906 term, trying to describe the way in which these people were constantly writing and rewriting their lives. So what I find fascinating is not only they have this absolutely theoretical exposition of what they're doing while they're doing it, discussion about literary form. They actually use the word form, which is a big 19th century, end of 19th century term. But they also perform it in the most striking way. So I said the scene of this kiss was described six times by different people. Those are mainly in letters uh, and biographical fi autobiographical fiction. But there's one scene of Arthur coming down early in the morning uh, when he was going to play the piano. He wanted to practice the piano because he was a good boy. He's age six. So he comes down to practice the piano and his father storms in, says, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? Why aren't you reading a book? And this scene appears in his diary, in his autobiography, and in two novels. <laughs> so you can, see, you can see the process of turning your own life into a novel in various ways. 
And um, Fred does the same stuff. He's very, very clever at writing these little stories that you realize have come out of their own family. And I find that a particularly fascinating side of the end of, I mean, the 19th century is obsessed with biography. It's the most popular genre of the 19th century. We've sort of forgotten how many copies were sold of these books. And they are absolutely in the center of that as a literary mode. And they're exploring it in really quite a sophisticated and self-conscious way. Let me tell you just one wonderful story, if I may. There was one day in, in Tremens, the house where they lived, where the mother was there. The three boys were visiting, uh, already wildly successful published writers. And they agreed that they would each spend a day writing a parody of one of the other brothers. And in the evening, they sat around the mother, center of the house always, the mother, and they each read out their parody. And each time, everyone in the room rolled around in hysterical laughter, except for the person being parodied who said, I just don't see it. I don't see what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can see them performing this game of competition between who is the better writer who's parodied, with, of course, at the center, the mother's approval. Who did she laugh most at? <laughs> you know? uh, I think that just captures that idea of what they're engaged in. Mm.